Good morning. Welcome to all of you as we gather to receive the blessings of the gospel through word and sacrament from our triune God this morning. We gather for worship on the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, the last several um, weeks we've been focusing on the establishment of faith and how faith is, is maintained, even in spite of many troubles and challenges that arise. We begin kind of a new cycle of readings and themes this week that focus now more on the response of believers in faith. And particularly today, we see that the response of believers is a readiness to share the gospel. We see that particularly in uh, ministers of the gospel that God sends out to proclaim his word. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We give our attention, as mentioned earlier, to the Gospel lesson today from Mark chapter 6. Dear fellow redeemed, you know, one of the highlights of last year's church 50th anniversary was an invitation we extended to three men who had grown up in our congregation. Christopher Gelzer, Tony Hansen, Steve Prowl. What makes them a, a unit is that each of them trained to be and were called to be a pastor in a congregation. We had known them growing up. We knew stories about them. In fact, during the anniversary year when they were brought up, oftentimes they were referred to not as Pastor Hansen, but as Chris or Tony or Steve. And people even said, you know, it's hard to call you pastor because we're so used to seeing you running around as a kid. But they, the invitation that was extended to them had a purpose. It said it was that they would come back to St. Mark and offer us a word of God, a text, and a sermon, and give us direction and encouragement from the word of God in our anniversary year and into the future. And each of them did that. And it was a great time for each of those Sundays when they were here as a preacher. And they were well received and they were honored for the position they held in spite of some of the foibles they had when they were used. Now you contrast that with Mark chapter 6, the first five verses, the verses right before what we're looking at today. Jesus had grown up in Nazareth. Jesus was a sinless person, humble, but he lived life right. He grew up from his boyhood days through his teen years to his adulthood times, and then at the age of about 30, he went out into public ministry. When he was invited back to Nazareth, his hometown, he was invited to preach in the synagogue that particular Sunday. And so he asked for the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he turned to the section that said, I have been anointed to preach good news to the poor, to bring joy to the sad-hearted and the like. It was a gospel text. 
prefiguring, reminding people what the Savior would do and be, the Messiah. The key point of his sermon was when he took the scroll, rolled it up again, gave it back to the attendant, and then he said to the, to the assembly, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The response was not what Jesus expected or really deserved. They ridiculed him. They criticized him. They booed him, if you will. And they said, who does he think he is? His brothers and sisters are all here. He grew up with us, he was a carpenter, and now he says he's the savior. They did not believe him for his clarity, his honesty, and his openness. They construed it as arrogance and sinful pride. In fact, it worked them up to such a point that they dragged him off toward, or shepherded him off toward the uh, crown of a cliff. And they were going to shove him off. They were going to kill their favorite son, believe it or not. Mark summarizes that day in Jesus' life as a very forgettable day in a certain sense, but he summarized it by saying, and Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. What if we had treated Tony Hansen or Chris Gelzer or Steve Prowl that way? What if we had said, oh, you, you think you're going to tell us something that we're supposed to listen to you and honor you by obeying that? What if we had criticized them, ridiculed them, booed them, not listened to them, turned very violently against them? I, I don't think that would have been a boost to their confidence as pastors and ministry. But we look today at this episode and see Jesus' reaction to being rejected by his hometown folk and his reaction was that he was unfazed. We're told in the text, the words just before this text, he went about village to village teaching the good news. If anything, Jesus responded to that negative criticism that he received as a reminder of the lostness of the lost. How tough it is to break through the barrier of unbelief when that heart is set against it. He, he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. And it, this rejection that he received just redoubled his efforts to get the word out even more. So he didn't stop preaching. He kept going. But he, augment, he introduced a new phase in his ministry. He had been some months in Galilee preaching continuously. And at the same time, he was training men who would be the apostles. They're called in this text the Twelve. Now it was the time that he was going to take those 12 and put them into further training. Much like with our seminary in the third year of a seminarian's um, school, schooling, he goes out in a vicar or intern year to get practical experience among people of all persuasions and uh, mindsets and the like to strengthen them in their work prepare them for the work that they would do and they would lead after he had ascended into heaven, finishing his work. Jesus wanted to grow his ministry. And I dare say we do too. We want to grow his ministry here. So let's take a look at this section from the Gospel, Mark chapter 6. The twelve were those men who would be the leaders of the church. 
the apostles. They, the, when Jesus prepared to send them out, he first did this. He called the twelve to himself. He called them to himself. Like a quarterback saying to this team, hey, huddle up, guys. We got to make sure we're all on the same page, executing the same play, doing the same thing for the same purpose. Jesus wanted to make sure that when his men went out, the apostles, these trainees, that what they shared was what Jesus wanted them to share. He wanted them to make sure that they would say the same message Jesus was sending. In fact, Jesus is the message, isn't he? It is his life and his works and his words that fuel and glue together Christianity. It is he who is the object of our faith, our trust, and our hope. And so he wanted these men, as they prepared to go out into the villages of Galilee, to get it straight, straight from Jesus. So when they went out, they could be very confident in calling people to themselves. Not to trust them as the object of their faith, but the Jesus that they would proclaim. The twelve had seen enough miracles. They had heard enough sermons. They had done enough one-on-one -on -one conversations to know that Jesus was the real deal. He was that promised Savior that he spoke of in Nazareth. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so Jesus wanted the disciples to point all eyes and all ears and all hearts on him. He would be the focus of their faith and of their preaching. He echoed John the Baptist. Remember when he saw Jesus come to him? He said, look at this man. Look, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Later on, Peter, one of the twelve, would respond to a question of Jesus. That question was, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? With the confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then to not to be discounted is the way John, another of the 12, would speak of Jesus and relationship to him. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, next two words, in him. See, the belief is in him, not in us, not in the minister, but in the Savior. And Jesus wanted the disciples to get that straight before they went out. So he called them to himself, and then we're told he sent them out. This was the training session for the 12. They would go out and tell his story, God's plan of salvation. They went out, I think a little bit more house to house. I think Jesus' ministry was more to public gatherings and um, synagogue services and the like. The disciples, it seems, went more house to house, one to one, like some other religious sects sects do in our communities. They come and come to your door and they want to give you to give them some time to hear their story. Well, these disciples went out and did that. They were assigned to go two by two. You might say, wouldn't he get twice as much done if he would send them out one on one? On one? Twelve men going out individually rather than six pairs. But I think you know too, especially when you're in training for something, that it doesn't come that easily all the time. It takes work, it takes effort. And two 
would be better than one, as the proverb says. Two would allow for one to speak and another one to fill in the gaps or clarify, or to be a credible witness to what, was the, what the one was saying. It also allowed them to have mutual support. As they went about their works, their work day by day. We don't know how long this was, a, probably a number of weeks that they went out two by two. But furthermore, he gave them authority over evil spirits. Can you imagine this? These trainees had seen what the public had seen. For months, Jesus had been going around and he had used his divine authority, his superior spiritual power to drive demons out of people. Wow. And he gave the disciples that same power, that same authority. Just think of that. Why did he do that? Well, the people had seen Jesus drive out miracles in public many times. And by the apostles being able to drive out demons themselves in the same manner, in the same way that Jesus did, only showed a close connection to Jesus and allowed people to say, let's listen to this message. This man has some authority that we need to pay attention to. But now Mark re 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 reviews the mechanics. He tells the disciples, when you go out, you're going to travel light, really light. He said, take nothing for the journey. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Nothing? Just take off the way you are? Yeah, that's right. They were to rely on the hospitality and the confidence of the people that believed their message to provide for their needs. This was it's rather radical, and Jesus didn't use this approach every time that he did training of the disciples, nor in the New Testament does he advocate this as a way for messengers of Christ to be supported. But in this case, he did this. He wanted to teach them very clearly to trust God for their body and life. The people you go to, when they welcome you into, your, into their homes, stay with them. They will give you food. They'll provide warmth. They'll provide shelter. And the whole point is that you don't spend any of your time messing around with the physical needs of your life because God will provide. Rather, you are to spend your whole business, your whole time, on the soul needs of people, that you would provide for them, provide them the word. Later on, after Pentecost, when the disciples start, became the apostles and started the New Testament church, started the preaching and so on, they went around with the same authority to preach with the authority over evil spirits, and they were to spend their time preaching as much as possible. But now Mark also identifies the message. He summarized the message with one word, repent. The disciples went out into the villages teaching that people should repent. That was Jesus' message too. In the beginning of Mark it says, repent and believe the good news. John the Baptist called people to repent. To repent has two parts. The first part is to listen to the law of God, to hear what he demands of us, what his expectations are out of our lives. And that is simply put, to obey his commands. And to do so 
in harmony with his holiness. Repentance, though, shows us what, through the law that we fall short of, of obeying God. We cannot save ourselves by our abilities and obedience. It's just not enough. It never will be. To repent is to acknowledge that we are sinners and we deserve to be sent to hell. But the second part of repentance is that Christ has paid for that sin, for all sin, and that through faith in Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are in harmony with God. And so that's what they did. They called people to repent. Even as your preachers, your teachers, remind you over and over again how important it is to repent. That's what church is all about. And they listened to the disciples, and many people did repent. But Jesus, his, remember, his prime purpose was to get the word out, get people to pay attention to the law and so that they would cherish the gospel. He said, for those people who don't listen to you, those people who don't believe you, scrape the dust of the, the dirt off of your sandals from their homes and keep on moving as a sign of God's judgment against you. I remember a story from many years ago and early in my ministry, there was an elderly pastor in a neighboring congregation whose role was to make visits on people that um, either were not coming to church, though they were members of church, or else they were people who had been referred to them. Well, this elderly pastor came to the door and knocked on the door, and the man on the inside, the object of the visit, took one look at him and said, what do you want? Well, he said, I want to talk to you about Jesus. I didn't have time for you. Goodbye. Slammed the door shut. He looked out and old Pastor Schultz was standing there, scraping his feet like this. And he opened the door and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm scraping the dust of your house off on your porch. As the Lord has said, in judgment against you. What do you mean in judgment against me? It's a sure sign that you do not believe in the Savior and you, therefore, are not worthy of eternal life. He said, do you really mean that? I wouldn't do it if I didn't mean it. Made the man think. And for a few weeks later, he called the pastor up and he said, I'd like to talk more about what you, just, what you did last time you, you visited me. You've got me thinking. You've got me scared. The law of God ought to scare us so that we don't trust our own works, that we repent of them, that we turn from them, that we renounce them, that we change our ways, especially the object of our faith. That object, again, is Christ. He is the message. He is the Savior. If the people of Nazareth criticized Jesus for speaking the truth, I want you to realize that we will be criticized too for speaking the truth. It may come mildly at work in the neighborhood, in family gatherings, where people criticize you or criticize the church for its teachings. But be prepared. It will come. Jesus said if they criticize the master teacher, they will also criticize the students. But what should we take from this? Why did Jesus send out the 12 in, in this training program? He wanted them to get the message straight, right? 
It takes work to get that evangelism message clear so that you can answer the objections of people. But more importantly, you can tell the story. You can tell the story of Jesus. It doesn't take a lot of elaborate training. Some of us have it. But all of us have the gospel, the law and the gospel. What this text tells me is, first of all, Jesus' love for the lost. May the Holy Spirit give to each of us this same the same seeking love that seeks to bring the gospel to those people who need it. And we all need it. Yes, Lord, give us seeking love. Love for the lost, especially for the lost, while there still is this time of grace for them. And give us a rich measure of this love because, remember, our Lord Jesus did all the hard work. He did the impossible job. He endured the pain. He bore the shame. He paid the penalty of our sins. The wages of sin is death. He paid that debt for you, for me, for all. And so let us not think about having to pay for our sins, but let us rejoice that our sins are paid for. And let that motivate us to reach out and to take the gospel message to other people. To the glory of our Lord Jesus' name. He was relentless. He drove himself to the cross and rose again in power and majesty and victory. Live in that power, live in that victory, live in that love, and share him. Amen. Please. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.